tonight, this book launch for the book Bourdieu and Marx. Just to say a little bit about that, my, my own intellectual trajectory has been very much, you know, I came, I came to sociology, I came to social science through Marx, and by reading Marx, and then later on I discovered Bourdieu, and I thought uh, Bourdieu gives you some very powerful tools for thinking about class and culture. I never really abandoned Marx, but in a sense Marx was a bit more in the background. But in recent years I've become increasingly interested in, in, in how do we think about the relationship between Marx and Bourdieu, and amazingly... Uh, about two years ago, Gabriella wrote to me and saying, there's this wonderful book which she's putting together. Could I help um, contribute to it? So I was very pleased to write a forward and very pleased to be involved in this book launch tonight. So um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and to all the questions. Let me introduce the panellists and I'll explain the structure of the evening. So Gabriella Palucci is Associate Professor in Sociology at, um, in Italy, in Florence, um, she is the person who has been, has, is the master person, mastermind behind this book, and she will talk for 20 minutes or so to introduce the themes of the book. Now, I, I want to say that Gabriella has had an accident we, uh, just a few hours ago. She is very, very keen to speak, so she, 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 will, she will make a start, but if, if she needs to stop, then she will stop, and that's important to respect that, because... But she is very, very keen to speak to us tonight, so I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from her. Um, and then we're hearing from Bridget Fowler. Bridget Fowler has a chapter in this book too, um, and I'm really thrilled um, to welcome Bridget to the stage. I've known Bridget for over 20 years. Um, I see Bridget, particularly her book in the late 90s on Bourdieu and cultural theory. That was one of the first books, I think, to really bring home the significance of Bourdieu as a cultural theorist and as, a, as, a, as someone Sorry. who was not just using particular concepts like cultural capital in a kind of positivistic way. She is a really important person in my own intellectual thinking. And I want to say one of the underpinnings of the book, I think, is a really important debate in Bourdieu studies around a, there is a powerful current of work reading Bourdieu as a phenomenologist. You know, as, as, and as embedded in kind of practice theory. Um, and I think the, 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 the main focus of this book and the work of Bridget and Gabriella is to say, actually, you know, Bourdieu was really very strongly influenced by Marx, and we shouldn't forget that Marx is current. So it's a, it's a very important debate intellectually going on here. And finally, really pleased that Ponima Padipati is joining uh, this discussion tonight. She wasn't involved in writing a chapter for the book, but um, as many of you will know who've seen uh, Nima um, in the LSC, she is a fantastically important collaborator. I was very keen for her to be a discussant because of her own intellectual trajectory, which has this enormous, I mean, anthropology, history, a bit of politics, a bit of economics, a bit of sociology, and she's now a comparative, a lecturer in comparative political economy over the road at King's College. And so it has this amazingly interdisciplinary interest and... and uh, works substantively on issues of caste in India, but is really interested in kind of how we think about inequality intersectionally and interested in the debates which Marx and Bourdieu open up. So I think she'd be a fantastic person to discuss this book. So we'll, we'll begin with Gabriella for about 20 minutes, um, and then pass on to Bridget for about 20 minutes, and then Nima for 10 minutes. Should leave for about half an hour for discussion, but I will just emphasise, if, if Gabriella needs to sit down or leave, then please bear with us while we organise that. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriella. Thank you. Uh, can you help me? Help me to... Yes. It is mine. Mine. Yes. So, thank you. Uh, uh, I would like uh, to thank this uh, department and uh, Professor Mike Savage, uh, in particular, for uh, having um, uh, for for, a, for the kind organization of this event and. Uh, Mike for having uh, written the foreword for for the book. Uh, I I am very very grateful. 
grateful for that. So I would also uh, um, thank the, the other colleagues who made possible this book because they helped uh, me uh, in, a, in a very, in a very uh, good manner. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. so um, editing this book fits in this in my research framework because uh, I wanted to uh, putting together. Uh, two relevant critiques of domination and power. Um, I would like now to uh, provide an overview of the, main, uh, of the main achievements of the book and its highlights. Uh, the book offers an insight into the way in which Bourdieu takes his stance toward the Marxian project. It is one of the least explored aspects of the, the work of Bourdieu. Uh, although several articles have been published in, the, in this topic, uh, so, uh, the, uh, on the relationship between Bourdieu and Marx, there isn't any study which deals with it in a broad way. So our book tries to uh, fill this gap. Um, as you can see in the title of the book, um, the, the main uh, topic of the book is uh, practicing, practicing critiques. So the hypothesis uh, that underpins the book is that the exercise of the critique, which both Bourdieu and Marx practiced in a radical way, is a strong connective tissue bonding their theoretical and empirical projects and the terrain on which we can show the debt of Bourdieu to Marx in the best way. Uh, let's recall that the work of Marx has produced enduring effects on the various traditions of contemporary critical theory. That is the case, for example, of the deep influence exerted by his criticism on the Frankfurt School, on the cultural studies, and on the subaltern studies. The same can be said of feminist critical theory, even if uh, less direct, obviously, and general. The sociology of Bourdieu can be fully placed in this framework. Although the stance of Bourdieu towards Marx doesn't remain unchanged over time, his dialogue with the Marxian system of critique is permanent, constant. I would also like to mention uh, another point at this uh, topic, in this topic. And, uh, Dealing with the topic of criticism or, crit or social critique is particularly important in this time, such as now, in which criticism in social sciences is under attack by so-called post-critical scholars, such as Boltaski or Latour, for example, who claim that paradigms of social critique are affected by relevant defects such as a view of social agents as socially incompetent. Bourdieu, in particular, is treated as the more, uh, most leading figure of this kind of sociology. Thus, one of the achievements of the book is to highlight that the sociology of Bourdieu, far from reducing people to oblivious puppets, fully recognizes that the contribution of individuals and groups to the production of social work. He develops a very original research focused on the subjective experience of domination, which the social sciences have mostly neglected. 
from this point of view, his sociology and notably his theory of symbolical violence and cultural capital is an enrichment of tra traditional paradigms of social critique, including that of Marx. The block is blocked. Okay, thank you. Now let me go on uh, to give a brief overview of uh, the affinities and the differences uh, between Bourdieu um, in the conception of critique. Uh, I highlight five main uh, points uh, about the, their idea of critique, and they are the, those. A critique as a weapon against domination, the appeal for reflexivity and the critique of theoretical detachment, critique of essentialism and the, real, the relational approach, the twofold articulation of critique, social structure and social forms of conscience, and the norm, non-normative model of critique. I apologize if uh, I have to be very, very synthetic. So the point one, critique as a weapon against domination, the sociology of Bourdieu is a sociology of domination. His overall work is an attempt to em at, employed, at employing the analysis of the social as an instrument against domination. For Bourdieu, sociology is a combat sport, a political practice in the name of science, against the illusion uh, of immediate knowledge and the evidence of the doxa, critical sociology aims to lift the veil on the truth of social structures and relations, which never reveal themselves totally for what they are. Thus, critical knowledge is designed not only to analyze the dominant configuration of the social, but also to change it. Here, it is easy to find affinities with the Marxian conception of the critique, for which it is a weapon to uncover material foundation of society, its contradictions, and its own forms of legitimation. This is a crucial aspect of the materialist dim dimension of Marxian thought and the cornerstone of this theory of revolution. Here, to, uh, to, uh, well, however, sorry, the link between Marx and Bourdieu is broken um, because while for Marx it is necessary to stop considering intellectual critique as the only instrument of social change and to transform it, uh, it into a re the revolution praxis, in Bourdieu, on the contrary, critique remains anchored to the dimension of scientific rationality, to the order of discourse. In other words, the symbolic enjoys ontological priority over the political. Needless to say how deep this gap is, uh, as the intellectualist conception of social critique tends to obliterate the forms of social trans transformations conceived by Marx. Uh, now the second point. Mm the appeal to ref of reflexivity. A second point of agreement between Bourdieu and Marx is the appeal for reflexivity. The, um, the imperative of reflexivity is at the heart of Bordesian theory of science. According to him, to him, the scientific knowledge has to be concerned with the social conditions or possibility in which is, it is produced. Thus, reflexivity is a break, not only with the silent evidence of the given order of things, the doxa, for example, but also with the presuppositions on, uh, on which knowledge 
of the social is built. In the same way, according to, Bourdieu, to Marx, just as criticism is always a critique of the historical world, it must be accompanied by the questioning of one's own history, historicity. This is the materialist conception of theory, which has to replace the idealistic one. The third point is the view of the social as relational and the critique of essentialism. Here we have some affinities and some differences. Uh, among uh, the, among the, uh, the ideas of critique that link Bourdieu and Marx to Marx, we have to include also the view of the social as relational. By considering domination on the basis of social classes, Marx has been led to forge the notion, notion of a social relationship of domination, which has been very influential in critical sociology, including that of Bourdieu. If for Marx the social relation of domination uh, can be achieved through economic constraint, for Bourdieu it can be achieved through symbolic violence. In both cases, domination produces a specific kind of sub, sub, sorry, subjectivation. Uh, the critique, uh, for, for both Bourdieu and Marx, the relation approach is based on a strong critique of essentialism, that is, as Bourdieu points out, quote, to privilege things rather than, re, rather than relations and to reify the social order. And the, the, critique, the critique of essentialism strongly characterized Marxian theory too. In his critique of political economy, for example, Marx maintains that capital and exchange value are not substantial things, but instead social relations. Their fetish character is an illusionary <coughs> representation as a property that commodities possess in themselves. And it is the reason why workers don't perceive values as an objectivation of their own labor. But uh, we have some uh, differences in the conception of social class and uh, capital. Um, it is necessary to highlight that despite these affinities, their vision of social class and capital is very different. On the other hand, on the one hand, Bourdieu, considering the Marxian notion of capital social class as a very essentialist concept, tries to build a less objectivist notion in reaching it with cultural and temporal dimensions. On the other hand, however, unlike Marx, he tends to shape the concept of capital in an essentialist way. If you want, then we can discuss about it because it is very, a very interesting, interesting topic. Uh, the fourth point, the twofold, arti twofold articulation <coughs> of critique, social structure and social form of conscience. The previous remarks lead us to understand that for Bourdieu, critical sociology has a twofold dimension. It in interlinks the structural dimensions of domination and the symbolic forms by which domination is reproduced <coughs> and legitimized. <coughs> in this, Bourdieu is in debt to Weber and Durkheim, but also to Marx, for whom critique is always critique of economic structures of capitalism and of the social forms of conscience. If we think about the complicity between habitus and field, or the theory of symbolic violence, we see very clearly this connection also in Bourdieu. Symbolic violence can operate 
because the condition of its efficacy are inscribed <coughs> in the very structures that it seeks to conserve. Similarly, the critique of political economy of Marx is both a critique of economic processes and of capit capitalist society and a critique of discourse that legitimize them. And capital itself is basically an immense biopolitical deposit that produces goods and people, symbols, objects, and psychologies. Thus, as our book wants to show in many ways, it would be a mistake to reproach, to, uh, to reproach Marx for having reduced domination to an economic phenomenon. But it still remains true that the forms of political and, uh, and ideological domination are always thematized as moments subordinate to economic domination. On the other hand, if it is true that Bourdieu leaves in the dark many of the hard aspects of capitalism, he doesn't limit himself to the analysis of the symbolic dimension of social domination, of social phenomena, sorry. On the contrary, he sees under the form of cautions, under illusion, illusions, beliefs, doxa, and so on, the structural dimension that underpins them. And it is exactly in this that lies the theoretical efficacy and the originality of his theory of domination. The last one point, um, a, a, a normative model of critique. Um, on the basis of the previous reflections, we can understand that the force of critique of Bourdieu is not rooted in some, in some principles outside the social uh, process or founded on an ideal order. His theory remains analytical and non-normative. Its scientific task is the analysis of domination which doesn't impose a set of a priori values and ideals but limits itself to unmasking and demystifying the forms of domination. In this, Bourdieu retains a Marxian orientation. For Marx, revolutionary practice should be driven by their immanent conditions, neither by religious, legal, or moral principles. We can define this model of critique as immanent. Uh, now, uh, some conclusion very briefly. Uh, the critical dimension of Bourdieu's sociology with these methods and tasks demonstrates very clearly both the presence of Marxian heritage and the tension inherent in its enrichment. We can agree with Brubaker where he claims that the relationship between Bourdieu and Marx is not so much one of appropriating individual themes or concepts as one of attempting <clears throat> to enrich the Marxian system with an analysis of the subject dimensions of domination, a task that Marx had set but which he doesn't completely achieve as Bourdieu himself maintains. Finally, Bourdieu's critical sociology can be seen as a fruitful develop development uh, of the work of Marx, both in, this, in his early works, where he can be clearly placed in the field outlined by Marx's critique of capitalism, and in the last years of his career, where his position toward Marx becomes more and more controversial and polemical. Thank you.
Thank you, Gabriella. And now we have uh, Bridget Fowler speaking. Shall I go up to the... It's up to you. Oh, uh, I can, you yeah, first? that's fine. Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Um, Bourdieu once bravely labelled himself a reflexive eclectic. Yet, as if to distinguish his sociology from Lenin's pauper's broth of eclecticism, someone, some of you will remember, the pauper's broth of eclecticism, he insisted on his theoretical coherence. My aim today, however, is not to dissect this eclecticism. Rather, it's to single out Bourdieu's affinities with Marx. Despite his critical comments on Marxism, particularly in the 1980s. So I'm continuing with what you have so ably started. Thus, Bourdieu often described himself as part of the historical materialist tradition, seen as a term of honor. In the same vein, he noted the profoundly materialist strand of Max Weber's work. For example, Weber's analysis of the religious field with its key opposition between priests on the one hand and prophets, their critics very often, on the other. Weber, he said, accomplished Marxist purposes where Marx was unable to redeem them. This refers in particular to his demystifying accounts of the privileged classes. For Weber argued that historically, as now, dominant classes have developed self-justifying explanations of their good fortune, theodicies, as he called them which have been systematized by the priesthood. Bourdieu, for his part, aims to blaze a trail further than either Marx or Weber did to produce a general theory of practices, or as he also called it, a logic of practice. Both Marx and Bourdieu go beyond a purely objective analysis of the emergence of new classes or new class fractions so as to clarify subjective lived experience via a phenomenological analysis. For example, you'll be very familiar with this example, Marx wrote in Capital about the lived experience of new commodities as they appeared on the market. He stripped away their aura, or what he called the fetishism of commodities. Marx also famously described the front stage of capitalism, wage workers' contractual agreements under the emblem of freedom, equality, and Bentham. And he contrasted this with a very different felt reality backstage, inside the factory doors, where the worker enters and gets a metaphorical thrashing. A tanning was his word. In the same way, in distinction, Bourdieu refers to the front stage, benevolent commitments to the democratic availability of high culture, such as opera, noting that backstage, the reality is very different. Even were all material barriers, like high ticket prices, to be removed, backstage, opera going serves to bind together, he says, an elect group the middle or upper class. And this is distinctive to um, Britain and a few other countries. It wasn't true, by the way, of late 19th century Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Such a group can thus continue to demand very high salaries, 
to permit their dignified lifestyles whilst also being subjectively secure in their self-esteem as very open and generous people. Marx always emphasized the distinctive absence of physical violence in the most modern branches of capitalism, thus clearly separating it, of course, from slavery. In particular, in Capital Volume 1, he considers presciently the ultimate logic of MCM1, uh, where money is invested in the production of useful commodities, C, chiefly to make more money, profits invested to make more profits. Marx is emphatic that historically, absolute surplus value has been extracted from workers in the form of longer hours of work or more intense work using the threat of the whip. But in the modern workplace, he says, relative surplus value extraction occurs. This results in part from improved productivity via technology. He even mentions robots way back in the 1860s. But it also results from greater competitive efforts demanded from workers via a detailed division of labor, extremely fragmented division of labor, where workers' labor power has been reduced to homogeneous and com therefore comparable abstract labor. We could think today of Amazon warehouse workers' labor, or indeed of academics with their F ref returns, their four articles every three or four years. It's true that Bourdieu's concept of capital is wider than Marx's. As is well known, it includes cultural capital, very briefly education, social capital, or patrons, influential friends who will give you jobs, and symbolic capital, your reputation or honor, all based, he says, on stored up social energy. Nor did Bourdieu draw directly on Marx's labor theory of value in its form in capital. Although I noticed reading his lectures, which are now uh, published as Sociologie Générale, and they're just coming out in English, he does say the labor theory of value is a great scientific acquisition. However, critical commentators often miss the section of Bourdieu's late Pascalian meditations where he refers to the twofold truth of labor. For Bourdieu notes here that labor is felt more alienating the more traditional craft skills are eliminated. He adds, the equalization of rates of profit presupposes great labor mobility, which itself presupposes, and here he quotes Marx's Capital Volume 3, the greatest possible reduction of labor in all spheres of labor to simple labor, a bit like abstract labor for Marx, the elimination of all vocational prejudices amongst laborers. And now I want to look at the legitimacy of modern capitalism. Bourdieu extended Marx's theories of domination without direct physical coercion, so as to introduce his own distinctive concepts, symbolic violence and negative symbolic capital. The latter, for example, would be felt by workers uh, uh, under the direct impact of unemployment negative symbolic capital. In particular, symbolic violence rests on the cultural dispossession of the masses in relation to what he calls a cultural arbitrary. In the past, this was knowledge of the military arts, or Latin and Greek. Now it's knowledge of the sciences, or um, uh, artistic modernism. Crucially, just as in feudalism, the lords had to support the spiritual lords, the bishops or the monks, 
So the spiritual soul of the bourgeoisie today is their support for the arts. This phrase, the spiritual soul of the bourgeoisie, comes from Marx on religion. Further, Bourdieu saw the increasing need for the dominant class over time not just to depend on the inherited transmission of economic capital with primogeniture, etc., but to legitimize their rule by their educational excellence, especially via institutional cultural capital, such as degrees, higher degrees, and so on. In acquiring such distinction, he quotes Marx, even the dominants are dominated by their domination. Thus the elite, or what he entitles the state nobility, have to be disciplined and ascetic in their work to gain higher qualifications, their cultural capital. But the key mechanism for such social reproduction, the privileged classes, he argues, reproduce themselves via these means. The key mechanism is misrecognition. Specifically, it's misrecognition to see as natural aptitudes what have, in fact, been passed on by bourgeois family socialization as the cultural categories of legitimate knowledge. In turn, the intellectually dispossessed often show a surprising complicity with the education system. He quotes trade union leaders who feel culturally intimidated in contact with the bosses. And that's particularly from distinction. Bourdieu's dominant class thus possesses a high volume of capital overall, but it has two fractions, rather like the different bourgeois fractions of the bankers and the industrialists in Marx's 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. The dominant fraction of the dominant class has greater economic than cultural capital. The managing directors, directors of great corporations financiers, generals, police chiefs. Those with more cultural than economic capital are Oxbridge and LSE academics, judges, bishops, certain politicians. In particular, the 1960s and 70s, when Bourdieu was undertaking much of his empirical research, was not just the period of the extended mass consumption of the Keynesian epoch, it was also a period of greater public service welfare bureaucracies in which even those with modest cultural capital flourished. Modern capital, capitalism for Bourdieu is based on a more elaborate division of labor than Marx posits, unlike in the traditional peasant world of, say, pre-colonial Algeria, the current economic field is governed solely by the maxim, business is business. That is, it's one where community or ethical constraints are minimal and practices that unsentimentally maximize profit or exchange value are normalized. Most importantly for Bourdieu, modern societies are made up of a fan of other fields such as politics, art, and literature. These are distinctive microcosms. This is the term he used late in his life, microcosms, with their own specific stakes and rules of the game, where the game may be considered with the utmost gravity. Art and literature since 1950 have been seen as founded on an individualistic cult of the artist as bohemian creator. Genius, historically, was seen as divinely inspired. Artistic production is still perceived largely in individualistic or magical terms as an innate gift. So just as Marx showed the real nature of industrial production behind the industrialists of genius, James Watt and so on, Bourdieu's dis disenchanted studies show the privileged social class positions veiled behind such artistic geniuses. <laughs>
particularly those he calls symbolic revolutionaries. They've created a symbolic revolution in their particular field, like, say, Manny. The appearance of the economy for the economy's sake, with its degradation or de-skilling of industrial labor, has as its other side the reverse world, the art for art's sake of the second half of the 19th century, and its ultra-skilled artistic geniuses. Now, in many respects, Bourdieu could be said to be the most enduring of the sociologists tracing the orthodoxies of the Keynesian period. As you know, the highest incomes then were subject to high taxation in the 1960s and 70s, uh, as Piketty, Thomas Piketty's three studies uh, from 2014, 2020, and 2021 have shown so well. And as Mike Savage has elaborated further in his The Return of Inequality, 2021. At the time of Bourdieu's research for distinction, capital had not yet become as mobile as in the era of globalization from the mid-1970s. Indeed, it is surely no accident that Bourdieu produced his major untranslated article on neoliberalism, the economic field, the dominant orthodoxy, as late as 1997. He was to die in 2002. Now, the reassertion of market power following Reagan Thatcher and Blair, and with it, the economically rich capitalist class fraction, he refers to, Bourdieu refers to, as the second conservative revolution. Would Marx have called it a counter-revolution? His model of the first conservative revolution was, a na was Nazism, which represented for him, as it did for Norbert Elias, his friend and fellow sociologist represented for him a de-civilizing spurt, a caesura or interruption in German humanist culture. The second conservative revolution represented, quotes, the end of a world, he said, the world of unionized, secure workers, mostly living in social housing. This restructuring was heralded via the rollout of new owner-occupied homes for what he calls, tellingly, echoing Marx, the holy family of working-class nuclear families. It was accompanied by employers' turn to temporary, casualized workers. And in fields such as literary publishing, a much greater premium placed on marketable, best-selling texts. Bourdieu interprets this rolled back welfare state as another de-civilizing spurt. Indeed, for him, these changes threatened to undermine what Weber had called, quote, the domestication of the dominated. Weber thought the welfare elements in the society domesticated the dominated class. Uh, to create, in other words, possible civil disorder, but he doesn't spell it out. I might just add, um, this is me, not Bourdieu, that in Scotland, as a consequence of austerity, the most deprived quintile of the population, 20% of the population, has experienced increased mortality rates since 2012. The latest study by my colleagues in Glasgow, Walsh and McCartney, has shown that in 2023, the lowest quintile, 20%, face only 47 healthy years of life. The highest quintile, on the other hand, has 70 years of healthy life. <laughs> 
finally, I turn to Bourdieu and social transformation. It is mistaken, in my view, to see Bourdieu as proffering a sociological theory of eternal elite reproduction, or ruling class reproduction. Nor is this a theory of liberation through sociology. It's true, he does regard literature and art and also sociology as having a role in bringing about reflexivity. As sociology gives a knowledge of determinisms, I'm quoting from him, as sociology gives a knowledge of determinisms and thus the possibility of liberty in relation to determinisms, to write sociologically or to tell everybody about it is to work to diffuse, to universalize the possibility of a liberty. I think the key source of dynamism in Bourdieu's social theory are rather the prophets, spiritual prophets or secular prophets. It is they who in their various fields instigate symbolic revolutions, often dismissed as lunatics or harshly repressed, like Galileo or Savonarola in late medieval Florence, their heterodox or heretical ideas will re-emerge elsewhere, as with Luther and then Calvin. Such prophets survive because their categories of thought fit the needs of the laity or their distinctive followers. Particularly, he says, at times of crises, when the world seems turned upside down, the masses turn in desperation to the authors of what were once construed as outlandish ideas. Bourdieu mentions war, plague, famines, mass inflation. At such times, large number of people experience hysteresis, i.e., given the new circumstances, they have a habitus, uh, a set of dispositions that no longer fits with the new reality. Significantly, Bourdieu takes on the famous terms of the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, where Marx says that in 1848, the June Revolution failed in part because it lacked leaders who had the realism and the imagination to produce a new vision of the future. Thus, secular prophets who emerge when other politicians are mute such as Danny Cohn-Bendit in the French 1968 May events, are like lightning rods who convey and express the extreme discontents of the masses, discontents both in their own field and more widely. Typically, these kinds of popular movements attract those who lack all capitals, not just economic capital, but cultural too and who could therefore be seen as having interests in change, reasonable interests in change. They may become taken up by the labor movement. Thus, alliances can occur between intellectuals and industrial workers, where intellectuals, and this is quoting him again, divert their accumulated cultural capital so as to offer to the dominated the means of objectively constituting their view of the world. In other words, producing a much more convincing world view um, to project to others. But unlike the Marx and Engels of the Communist Manifesto, Bourdieu didn't see the prophets of the left, like Gramsci or Daniel Cohn-Bendit, as necessarily more persuasive than others. Um, populist nationalism, such as in France, the Front National, or now Rassemblement Francais, have contested these thinkers, these masses. In this respect, Bourdieu regarded actual empirical class consciousness as needing to be understood and interpreted analytically. There is no single essentialist law predetermining its development. <clears throat> 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Bridget. That was wonderful. And now on to Dr. Nima. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm thrilled to be with you here tonight, uh, not as a contributor, but really as somebody who I feel a little bit as though my role is to be here as a celebrant to this book. So we have just received um, you know, uh, two incredibly wonderful talks that have given us a little taste of the terrain that this, that this volume covers and sh has shown us um, both the places where the work of Bourdieu and Marx diverged, but also the incredible um, and productive overlaps between the two. And what it gives us, I would say, is not only an introduction to this incredibly rich terrain, but actually it gives the reader a set of tools for how to think about these theoretical frameworks both together and how to apply them for a number of our critical challenges in this moment. So this is, in some ways, um, I don't know if it was set out to be, but it's quite a practical text. There is much to both learn from it, but also to use from it. And so let me say a little bit about how I see that. So this uh, text, which is available outside for purchase after this talk, if you would like to buy one, uh, covers uh, in, its, in the number of essays uh, inside. If you are not familiar or if you're already highly familiar with both Marx and Bourdieu, you will nevertheless get a very rich education in both the kind of legacy that Marx in some ways leaves for Bourdieu. So one of the kind of provocative and really interesting things is to think of us um, all as inheritors. Inheritors not perhaps of capital, but of debt. And of Bourdieu as a figure who in some ways it is useful to excavate the ways in which he was actually indebted to Marx, even as he um, consciously pushed against both some of of Marxist concepts, but also pushed against kind of Marxist um, formulations and discussions in his own time. Um, and so you get a sense of that debt um, and also of us as inheritors of, of some of those long conversations. As a result, you get in this account a really a much you know, richer uh, set of conversations, not only between the marks that Bourdieu inherits, um, but also between a number of other really central kind of figures in terms of how to think about the relationship between social structure and social consciousness, how to think about social reproduction, how to think about domination and exploitation, how to think about class. And so here in these conversations, um, you see Norbert Elias, uh, but also Althusser, um, also Foucault, uh, and so what you get is a real kind of account of both in some ways the, the milieu of the kind of middle to later half of the 20th century and what it importantly brings out, which um, you have already heard a little bit in Gabriela's uh, presentation, is the importance of critique and what critique meant to both Bourdieu and Marx. And why is that particularly important? Um, so here are some of the reasons why not only does this book give us a, a really rich education, but it gives us an education for our particular time. So why is it important that we think about Marx and Bourdieu together and you know, um, both as kind of in the ways they overlap and in the ways they di diverge in this particular moment? And it is important in some ways, not as a you know, general theoretical exegesis, but rather as a way of really trying to answer some of the most critical challenges of our time. So as um, as Mike points out in the foreword to this book, this is being written and presented in a moment where we see, as Thomas Piketty has pointed out, rising inequality in almost every country, uh, well, you know, charted um, and shown to us over the last, you know, over the course of the last 20 to 50 years. Right? And not only do we see rising economic inequality, um, but it is important, as Piketty tells us, to look at that inequality in terms of wealth, which is to say that there are a number of different ways of thinking about the ways in which social stratification and economic hierarchy are produced and reproduced, and how <coughs> should we both recognize that and measure those differences. And what Piketty says is that 
one of the things that really matters is wealth. Perhaps it has been really underappreciated up until now. And wealth matters because more than the kind of inequalities we experience in terms of, say, food insecurity or income inequality, wealth is something that, because it is passed down across generations, is one way in which social inequalities are deeply reproduced generation upon generation. But once you start to think about wealth in particular, you start to think about other forms of inheritances. And this is where the kind of rich overlap between Marx and Bourdieu becomes really important in our own time. So what is it that we pass on in ways that make real um, social solidarities and transformation and equality that much harder Well, we pass on wealth? but we also pass on cultural capital, as Bourdieu reminds us. We pass on our social connection. And these are the ways in which you know, our um, commitment to greater equality is constantly and systematically thwarted at the level of, um, you know, at the level of geographical um, segregation, at the level of racial uh, disparities at the level of gender inequalities. And so one of the kind of challenges that we, are, we face consistently over and over again is not just the reproduction of inequality, but how we should think about the relationship between the economic and the social. Um, how we think about the relationship between the, uh, and how we remediate those deep disparities. Because if we think these inequalities are fundamentally and only material, we think re redistribution is quite easy. And we discover that actually, well, redistribution, as we know, is not that easy. And you know, uh, logistically and politically, um, still very hard to produce. But it, it often does not get to the kind of deeper ways in which we are socially divided. And that those social and economic divisions go hand in hand. They're not simply separate but they are coterminous in ways that require far more both attention but also real critical analysis. Um, and so what this book offers us is actually a real kind of fascinating set of tools for our time. Because as Nancy Fraser reminds us, what we need is not just redistribution but recognition. We need both of those things at all times. And so what you get is um, what this book in some ways gives us a kind of startling reminder of is the way in which actually there's so much shared terrain between Marx and Bourdieu that both are really committed to things that are, it's very easy to kind of overlook, um, but are really important, again, to try and think about, again, in this kind of critical analytic moment, right? And so, for instance, what this book reminds us is that both are really committed to pra praxis. And while that might meet different things in different ways. Um, what it reminds us is that it is social action, it is um, shared commitments, it is habitus, and many other ways in which we constantly produce and reproduce ourselves, our social worlds, and the material worlds in which we live. So that's one thing, that these are not simply ideological forms, that the ideology and the reproduction through lived material experience is central, that these differences are, and these forms of stratification are deeply embodied. Um, in my context where I work on caste inequalities in India, people often wonder, well, aren't there laws that um, make caste discrimination illegal? Um, don't those exist in India and aren't they sufficient? And the problem is that just as you know, forms of discrimination are illegal in other parts of the world, what, what we overlook is the way in which these differences are deeply embodied. So caste is not um, an abstract thing. It is in the way we eat. It is in the way we speak. It is in the way we live our lives. And so to really kind of get at and undo the discrimination without asking people to necessarily undo their ways of being in the world right, um, is, is a real challenge. And so, why, so this book. I will say, and this is the kind of this is where I will end with, end my um, you know activities as celebrant, gives us two things. One is that it gives us a way of um, returning to the importance of critique, 
So since, to some extent, since the 68 moment, there is a wider context in which um, we, critical theory has in some ways taken a backseat to a, to a set of theories which, despite their important contributions, have told us that any kind of um, critical theory and ide ideology critique is not only unnecessary, but what it does is that it fails to recognize the agency of you know, actual actors, of actual subalterns. And what we miss when we kind of say that, OK, there's no need for critique. What people believe is what they believe, and we are going to kind of, um, in some ways, take that on face value, right? Because anything else would be demeaning or, or belittling. But actually what that ends up doing is it fails to, so why do we still need critique? Why do we still need critical theory? Why do we still need ideology critique? And partly, as Bourdieu and Marx show us, that the structures of domination and exploitation still remain difficult, you know, invisible. Right? And so they help us excavate those structures of domination that are often reproduced and told to us as though they are the forces of, of our liberation. Right? So the very things that dominate us appear to us as though they are, in fact, recognizing us, as though, in fact, they are validating us when they are not. Right? So we need critique because we need that form of empowerment. The other thing this book gives us as a real tool is a way of thinking, again, if class is both economic as well as deeply socially divided and embodied and reproduced through culture and praxis and activity, then what we start to see is that um, these things that feel intractably different and incommensurate are actually places where we could start to build solidarities, right? So where we think we are deeply divided um, along lines of real incommensurability, those are places where we could start to build solidarities. So I, and, I, and the last thing I will say is that I read this in some sense as a scholar who is thinking about the Global South, who is thinking about the context of um, South Asia in particular, and who is thinking about both race and caste and other forms of, um, of social stratification and difference, and which is not always directly what this book speaks to, but it nevertheless gives us lots of tools for thinking about those things. Because this is a moment where a lot of my students really want a kind of decolonial practice and a de you know, decolonized syllabus. But that is not a straightforward thing. And the reason it is not a straightforward thing is that in the context of, say, caste oppression in India, there are people who argue, um, provocatively but also interestingly, that colonialism was not a bad thing. Because caste violence and caste hierarchy pre-exist British colonialism, and those forms of transformation were actually liberating, right? So who wants to decolonize a syllabus and why? There are actually multiple different standpoints. And there, you know, and there is not a kind of either homogenous or simple way of thinking about um, how to go about creating these important critical conversations. And so the kind of anti-essentialism that runs through the book, but the real importance of you know, critique, the exposition of social domination, um, the possibility of solidarity and transformation, this is, these, these are sets of tools that I think can illuminate different sets of conversations um, at, in different social and historical locations. So I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Gabriela, are you okay? Do you yes, want to I. Usually. Yes, maybe. That's fine. Come here. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Where are you um, going? Yes, because I have to go to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you no, very that's much. That's all right. <laughs> Hope you recover quickly. <laughs>
That's been a fantastic uh, panel, and um, I think uh, the book is available for sale outside, and when, at 8 o'clock you'll be able to buy your copy. Um, we have about 20 minutes, a bit more than 20 minutes left for Q&A and discussion. I suggest that we have questions in bunches of two or three questions, um, and that we also, I think, have a Zoom, Zoom link, so questions will be coming in on chat. But perhaps I can just throw it out to, um, to the floor to see who would like to contribute. And please, can you just say who you are and where you're from to, to kick things off? Yeah. Hello, I'm Riyad Akbar. Oh. Um, hello. I'm, I'm Riyad Akbar. I'm from London. Can, um, can we hear a bit louder? I'm, can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Um, my question was really about consciousness. So um, uh, I picked up the point regarding, you know, it doesn't necessarily follow in any sort of deterministic direction. But in terms of the consciousness of the dominated, so I think that is a... Um, I, I, I defer to you, but I believe that is one key difference between kind of Marxist thinking about the development of the um, of working class conscious through class struggle and Bourdieu's con con um, concept of um, uh, social domination and what arises from the dominated fraction in terms of the development of their consciousness. Because I think there was a quote put on, there is something socially defective in so far as having been dominated, you don't really have the education or the opportunities of leisure to develop um, uh, your understanding of what's being done to you. Um, hence the I idea of misrecognition. So could you talk a little bit more about, you know, if, if in Bourdieu, um, the development of the dominated consciousness doesn't follow any teleology, it could appear for readers of Bourdieu that in fact it doesn't actually go anywhere. It's kind of stuck in this kind of static um, state of being somewhat defective. Okay, we'll get another couple of, or uh, one or two more uh, before. Yep, yeah, in the front here. Thank you. Um, I think uh, my name is yeah. Felicia. My name is Felicia from King's College London. And I think my, um, my question is more about Purdue. And uh, well, uh, uh, Professor Fowler, you mentioned that um, it's Purdue is not simply an um, the Bordesian view is not an eternal elite reproduction. Uh, but you also mentioned about the key mechanisms of um, elite reproduction, which is the misrecognition to see as natural attitude of that dominance. And my question is that, it, this, this has been um, a question uh, from my reading of Bourdieu, is that it seems Bourdieu's critique of sociology, it seems that his theory um, is to awaken that recognition, to reveal the doxa, and um, to, to have that political um, awakening of that from that misrecognition, but then what happens after then? Because uh, if my understanding is correct, then it would eventually lead to a change, and that change will lead um, to another set of inequality. Maybe the same one, maybe the same elite would still dominate, or uh, another one would prevail. Hmm. So would that mean that, but, but you also mentioned that it's not an eternal, eternal elite reproduction, so. Uh, I, I just want to make it clear whether, whether then any change would eventually lead to inequality. Is that um, unavoidable, or is there any other way around it? Thank you. Is that good question. Um, is there any one more? Yeah, over here. In front. Thank you. My name is Ahmad. I'm from a first year PhD student at King's Business School, King's College London. My question is simple. Why now? Why has the discussion or dialogue between these grand theories has been overlooked for quite a long time? And why, specifically now, is the best time to disface it? Thank you. Okay. Um, should I repeat the questions quickly? Or did, or yeah, did you get the, them? The, the first one I understood as being a question about the difference in class consciousness between Marx's conception of it and Bourdieu's conception yeah. of it. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, and uh, what I w would want to say about that was that um, uh, Bourdieu uh, was against Althusser, who saw 
agents, social agents, actors, as entirely passive bearers of structures. He um, disputed strongly Althusser's very pessimistic view in that respect. Um, and uh, he, he said there's always the possibility for resistance that people have. Um, but uh, they, as a person there in the front, used the word doxa, that what they're ex uh, exposed to frequently are taken for granted attitudes that things are normal, uh, that um, masculine domination is normal and female subordination is normal, or that, in the case of class, uh, that it's, it's natural that uh, there should be um, an elite that owns a large part of the wealth of a society. Um, and um, I think uh, Bourdieu did not agree with that. Um, he was a, a heresiarch. He was a heretical prophet in many ways. Um, there's a, a, a little article which he wrote with Boltansky very early on in his life um, in which he said, we have managed to eliminate uh, a lot of the fatal diseases of infancy, like diphtheria. We've eliminated um, smallpox. Cannot we similarly eliminate the sort of education which consigns most people to having no understanding of their cultural heritage at all? He, he thought we could eliminate such a very unequal education system. He thought it was conceivable. He called it a rational pedagogy, which would change such a thing. Um, equally, he noticed how many people often said, don't know, in response to pollsters, opinion, opinion pollsters. And he thought it was possible that you could educate people more so that they could actively take part in citizenship. Did he believe that we would ever get a, a totally equal society? Probably not. I think he did feel that there would always be some form of domination. But I think of a much less severe and disabling kind than the kinds that we have known. Um, particularly, I mean, the most recent you, as person there talked about um, inequalities of wealth. Um, Piketty's most recent brief history of equality, which hasn't yet been translated, he says that in the USA, uh, the bottom 50% uh, of the population now has less than 10% of the wealth. 50% has less than 10%, and this is a change. Um, the 40% the in the middle class in the US has lost a quarter of its wealth since 1980. Uh, the income of the top 10%, not wealth, but income of the top 10% in the US represent 45% of the total. Now, it goes without saying that Marx would not have been very happy with those <laughs> statistics, um, but Bourdieu would have been profoundly disturbed by them as well. Um, the second person spoke about the awakening of consciousness. And I think that's a very um, uh, ex uh, important question. Um, and it's one where uh, Bourdieu had a big difference with Jean-Paul Sartre and Franz Fanon. Um, Bourdieu was actually in Algeria when it was still a colony. He was drafted there. Um, and put it into a section of the army where he did um, a sort of questionnaire of consumption. Um, but he also saw what the impact of the French army was. And he was secretly um, in favor of the revolution of the, the FLN, the liberation of Algeria from the French. Um, and um, it, he there saw whole... He, they'd been called ghost armies of people who'd been up, uprooted from their lands by the French colonialists and then uh, later on by the French army and who uh, were desperately trying to get a living either they were 
um, hawking, you know, plastic goods in towns, or they were um, working in factories in places like Oran and Algiers, um, or they were just living off aid in um, strategic hamlets. The French had got the idea from the Vietnam War. Um, and um, what he said about then is that they cannot have what Marx talked about as class consciousness, because that presupposes that you know where your money is going to come from tomorrow, or you'll know where it's even going to come from next week, so that you have time to organize, to, to communicate, to read political literature. These people were so uh, impoverished and so much um, um, cast out of their traditional ways of acting uh, that they, did, they had neither the time nor the tools to be able to forge what he called rational class consciousness. And he disputed with Sartre and Fanon, who saw them as people who were going to um, immediately bring about a revolutionary uh, class consciousness because they were the most um, disinherited. Uh, and I think, you know, if we think today about people who are um, Amazon workers or people who are um, driving those little um, uh, bikes where they've got food on Be the back. back, yeah. They're so precarious that they haven't got the time to plan a uh, rational, organized action. Uh, and they're also so terrified of their employers that they can't easily um, come together in trade union actions. So there's extreme problems of that sort. And actually at a conference, uh, right at the end of his life, where I saw Bourdieu, he was there, and I, I asked this question, I said, don't you think that in the West now, we're seeing, so to speak, the third world in the big metropolises. We're seeing the replication of the sort of things you saw in Algeria, now again in the Western cities. And he said, yes, I'm very sorry, I'm afraid that's true. The sort of time consciousness people have is not very suitable for this kind of action. I don't want to be pessimistic. I know there are people who are organizing these uh, workers but it's going to be an extremely uphill struggle. Um, and um, the, the, the last question was about um, questions about consciousness. Um, yeah, it, you're, you were quite right in saying that what he always drew attention to was, A, the fact that a lot of what we, following Marx, would call ideology is just something that's taken for granted. It's... it's uh, you, you think of it as normal and natural. Um, uh, and and uh, this, this leads to problems. Um, it's, it's perhaps most evident where uh, people assume that, say, it'll be men who will have the jobs after there's the, the good jobs after a child has been born, uh, not a woman. Um, but that kind of taken for granted naturalized uh, situation of inequality uh, Bourdieu thought um, was uh, what um, people like Husserl had drawn attention to and was, uh, was extremely important. But he did say that uh, you shouldn't therefore become fatalistic, um, that people uh, could uh, see the necessity for a, a change of consciousness. But in relation to feminism, um, where consciousness raising, of course, was a very mm. significant element of the 1970s and 1980s, he says, not just a question of raising people's consciousness, you've got to change their whole bodies. People have actually got to retrain. Uh, women tend to walk in a different way from men. Uh, in Algeria, women do not look up and look at men. They walk with their eyes on the ground. You have to retrain the whole body 
so that you don't do that. Um, and I'm sure he's right about that. He didn't say it was impossible, but it was just, it was, it's more difficult to change than people sometimes imagine. So I just have a few quick things to say. One is that um, in response to your question about consciousness, um, that one of the things that this book points out is that there is more than one Marx, there is more than one Bourdieu. And it is entirely possible to think of uh, consciousness, its formation, its, um, and its transformation as linear, right? Um, or inevitable, um, depending on what versions of these theorists you, or quite difficult, right? Um, when I was in, so I trained in, uh, in grad school at a time when the word consciousness had been largely supplanted by, to some extent, this is my reading, by the word, by the term social imaginary. And, you know, while no one has quite articulated this, I think that is because there is something that appears, importantly, um, democratic about this idea of social imaginary. What you believe is neither true nor false. It is the kind of collective imaginaries that we share socially. And while that was really important, um, and it appeared in important ways to reassign agency to those sets of beliefs and practices, um, and in some ways kind of eschewed this idea of falseness. You can, have, you can suffer from false consciousness. You cannot suffer from what, is, what does it mean to suffer from a false imaginary, right? It's, you know, an imaginary is both made up and true at the same time, right? Um, but I think that in some ways what we need, what we need to return to is actually to think about consciousness again, both because it is difficult to engage and transform our consciousness collectively, but it also remains both ever important and possible, and that is a version of Marx and Bourdieu that I would like to kind of um, excavate um, and kind of take from this book, which is to say that some people imagine uh, that this, that, <laughs> let's see, that the problem with this idea of consciousness is that it is quite, that there's a certain top-down version of what it has, what it means to have to be really, you know, to have a, a raised consciousness. Um, or that maybe some people will not get there. There's some kind of you know, assigned destination we're supposed to get to. Right? So it is either linear, it is top down, people are excluded from it, um, and it doesn't kind of validate where people already are. But I think that what it actually gives us um, as a way of conceptualizing this problem is to both say that there is no destination. We are making it as we go along, and we are doing it together, and we are doing it actively, right? So. Um, there is real activity there, and yes, it's hard, um, whatever it is, such that we remain, especially in this moment of, you know, any amount of, you know, um, uh, false news on, uh, you know, in the Twitterverse and in our kind of social media landscape, right, that we are in these silos that are really difficult. So we, we understand how kind of, you know, difficult this problem is, but also how we are active agents in trying to break down some of those silos. Um, and, and to that end, I would like to say that one of the most exciting things to see as somebody who comes um, uh, from the US is that it is Amazon workers who are leading the, the fight for unionization mm -hmm. in the US, yeah. right? And that unions which mm -hmm. have had a real setback over the last many decades are making a real resurgence mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. And those Amazon workers are at the forefront of that. So, um, you know, what if we don't have time or the possibility to engage in this work of solidarity and you know, the transformation of our consciousness and our political um, consciousness? Well, it is both a real challenge and it is a real possibility, um, to which there is no end destination. We are making it as we go along. About, the, um, about inequalities, so, so I had said there, you know, there, that the book kind of shows us all these overlaps. It also shows us, I think, in some ways, the real productive it, it takes the kind of the divergences as productive conversations so um, between these two thinkers. And so to some extent what I mean by that is the fact that I think what really matters in terms, like what is very useful about thinking about Bourdieu is that he shows the ways in which 
class is not homogenous. Um, it is that class formations, elite classes, are very both diverse and ranged against each other, and that to inhabit a class is not necessary. It can mean money. It does not necessarily mean money, right? But there are ways in which the diverse ways in which elites produce and reproduce themselves also at times can, even though it is very difficult, turn you know, these intangible forms of capital into things that are a little bit more fungible. So you don't have wealth, well maybe you have cultural capital, maybe you have social connections, maybe you have these other things. And so in some ways, there, you know, one per potential reading, for instance, is this reading of Marx that we get from Moish Postone that says that where, so Moish Postone, um, the historian slash sociologist um, from the University of Chicago, basically has this account in which the value form makes all life um, and all value appear and in some ways become fungible, right? So different forms of labor are all, are all valued the same. Different kinds of commodities can be exchanged through the medium of money. It looks like all that is solid melts into gold because we are all kind of equivalences, we are all replaceable, we are all you know, the same as each other. And Bourdieu in some ways shows that we're not. Right? That, we, that there are all kinds of ways in which um, you, know, you and I could have exactly the same qualifications, and yet we have very different social positions, um, class solidarities, ways of being in the world, that we are not as, um, you know, that despite the transformations of, of capital, all that is solid has not melted into air. Right? And so I think the productive tension between those ways of thinking about class and inequality show, have some way of thinking about both the ways in which inequalities can be challenged, but also the ways in which they are constantly reproduced. Thank you. Uh, it's eight o'clock, uh, so I think we need to stop. I will just, just conclude by, by believing this has been a fantastic conversation and discussion. And I actually think, from my perspective, I mean, one of the very interesting points which actually Gabriella made in her presentation was that you know, um, Marx and Bourdieu both, you know, seem to be obsessed by class, but actually neither of them say that much about class, okay? But Marx has this famous thing about the fragment breaks off, you know, when he begins elaborating his theory of class. And Bourdieu is often seen as authorising, you know, class-centric accounts of all sorts of stuff. He very rarely uses the concept explicitly, and when he does, it's with all these kind of caveats. And, mm -hmm. and actually, much of the conversation in this book is about the concept of capital, and which you know, is clearly central to Marx, and it's central to Bourdieu, and of course also Piketty, who have come up. And I think that's, in some ways, a much more productive and fluid way of understanding how inequality and, and the politics of inequality plays out. And it also allows you to use class in a much more intersection. You know, class is one of the dimensions of that, but gender and race and other, other inequalities are all about, also bound up with it. So I think it's, in that way, it's been really, uh, a really important contribution in getting us to think creatively and productively about how to, how to read for the best marks and the best board year for the current time. Look, it's been a fantastic, um, it's, it's a great shame Gabby had to leave, but I think we really enjoyed her contribution and thank you to Bridget and Nima. Um, there is the book available for sale outside. Please do 